typical month. Huh. This has not been a typical month. But none of them are, are they? Each month brings its own minor miracles and milestones in family life. Even so, this one has been more momentous than most for us. Benedict started school. He is a rising five, as they say. So his official full-time education began. Getting him ready for school was far more traumatic for me than for him. His nursery school had caringly primed him for primary. I felt less prepared. Sitting up late on the eve of B-Day, before big school, I had to construct a shoe bag for his plimsolls and sew on Cash's name tapes. It all made me feel so terribly old, even more ancient than my descending 36 years. Those little name tapes and the smell of new rubber gym shoes transported me back to my own first day at school. I went on my fourth birthday, anxious to start life on my own, independent of my younger sisters, who seemed to be arriving annually. My berry still had its stalk upright. I was knee-high to a grasshopper and knee-low to an oversized green blazer. I can remember it vividly. I don't think anyone forgets that particular first time. My husband Simon says he can recall his first day with unfaded clarity. From the grey socks he wore, everyone else had brown, to the picture of his family's Austin 7 he drew on that first morning. Benedict too set off in grey socks, grey cord trousers with a real fly zip, of which he is inordinately proud. Royal blue top and navy lace-ups proudly polished by his father to a high gloss shine, that all but reflected his mother's misty eyes. What is it about small boys dressed up in the uniform of grown men that catches at one's heart? Partly the incongruity, isn't it? Like a toddler in his dad's giant boots. And that glance back in time you get at what your husband must have looked like on his first day. Benedict strode ahead of me on that first morning, his dinner money a jingle in his new backpack, satchels are out, you understand, with a reflector embedded in it, for going to school in the fog, he tells me. I hardly noticed the other mothers handing over their offspring to life. I felt atrocious, gripped by searing abdominal pain, dizziness and nausea. My friend Sally, whose Katie was starting on the same day, diagnosed it at once. First morning nerves, she said. I had mine last night. I left Ben laughing happily in class one and crept home, clutching my sides. Within five hours, I was being rattled off to hospital in an ambulance. My first morning nerves had developed into severe pelvic infection. And Miranda, who was still being fed by me, came too. Our large suitcase contained her nappies, creams, stretch suits, rag boy doll, jars of food, trainer beaker and sterilising equipment. For me, there was a toothbrush and some overdue proofs of family circle. The hospital duly supplied me with a standard issue disposable nightie, the sort that's made from the same fabric as J-cloths. I looked like a badly lagged boiler and I didn't care. At first, I feared I was going to die at once. And as the pain raged on, I fear I was not going to die soon enough. That's salpingitis for you. Imagine the scene, if you will. I am being given a cocktail of antibiotics, called affectionately by the consultant the Domestos treatment, because it kills 99% of all known pelvic bugs. This is being administered intravenously. Above the bed hangs the drip. Miranda, caged and restless in an adjacent hospital cot, takes the drip to be a mobile like hers at home and swings delightedly on it whenever she can reach it. Consider, too, the problems of trying to change the nappy of an uncooperative baby in a high cot whilst being wired to a drip. My daughter thought hospital a quiet, dull place and strove to make it otherwise which is probably why we were asked to leave.
well, discharged with unseemly haste at the end of a week. What of Ben's first day at school? I imagined him deeply traumatised. Just think, you go to big school in the morning and when you get home, they've taken your mother to hospital. We both survived. He has a fairly laid-back attitude to hospital. My own mother's long illness means that he's used to hospital visiting and is unstirred by the curious practices and sights. Once, observing an elderly catheterized colonel carrying his transparent plastic bag down the ward, he pointed to the clear liquid and challenged him, Where's your fish? Seasoned visitor of the sick, he knows the phrase, nil by mouth above a bed. That means we can eat the grapes we bought, doesn't it, Mum? My magic mother-in-law, Gwen, materialised like a fairy godmother to mind the family. After a week of Gwen's care and steamed fish, her faith in the restorative powers of fish is probably her only failing. I felt able to collect Ben from school. He's been a bit hot and tired this afternoon, said the teacher. And that evening brought a high fever, rash and diagnosis of German measles. When last year Ben heard the friend of his had got this fancy sounding disorder, he wept with envy and demanded to have one too. It turned out he thought it was some kind of exotic pet, gerbil weasels. The week of our joint confinement at home does not bear describing. Even if I had been able to get out of the house, I could not have gone very far. Simon was out driving when an American-style pickup truck piled into our car and drove off. He dutifully went to report the incident to the police, and they informed him that the registration number of the vehicle, um, the hit-and-run driver that he reported, belonged to a combine harvester. And then they breathalyzed him. Anyhow, bits of the car now work, Ben's back at school, and I'm better. Yesterday, I was spooning savoury beef and noodles into Miranda's obliging mouth and thinking I might be overfeeding her since her face looked rather chubby. By night time, she resembled a smiling football. The spotty chest and temperature confirmed it. We are again being visited by the gerbil weasels. <sighs> Perhaps next month will be a little less typical and a little more quiet.